iClear seminar. I myself had nothing to do with these papers, so uh, that's uh, one thing. I did was uh, a bit more than a month ago at the UPC, and that was about the time that the iClear papers came, the results came out, and I was with uh, Xavi Giro, and he said, okay, we got accepted. I thought, okay, maybe we should organize a, a seminar. And then he said, uh, hey, you guys actually also have a paper. I didn't know. And that was the paper of PM. So, okay, we have two talks today, and uh, I think it will be interesting. And I guess, Victor, go ahead. For the first Thank you. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, this iClear paper called uh, well, Skip RNN, which is an RNN model that's able to skip some state updates. Uh, and that's a work that's co authored with uh, Brandon Ju from Google, my advisors uh, Jordi Torres from BSC, and Xavi Giro from UPC, and Shifu Chang from Columbia University. So, to motivate uh, this work, uh, let me introduce you first to Recorder Neural Nets. Probably you are familiar with them. So, they are a state of the art in many tasks right now. And the way they work is that they have this recurring connection that allows them to process variable length inputs and outputs. But in practice, although this is a nice visualization of them, how we plot them in papers and so on, in practice we have something like this when we work with RNNs. Okay, so you have your whatever input sequence you have, your outputs, and then you unfold this in time. Okay, so the, the actual computations that are being done here, you can depict them in this way. Okay, so you can see that this is completely sequential which in part this is good. This is the reason why RNNs can actually model these uh, temporal dependencies and temporal evolutions in the signal. But at the same time, from the optimization and the computational side, uh, this introduces some potential issues, especially when this uh, sequence is very long. Okay? So these issues, some of them could be like slow inference, for example. Why? We cannot parallelize across time steps in RNNs. So what happens here is that until you are done with uh, some time step, you cannot go and process the next one. So this can be slow no matter what uh, hardware you have. Uh, also, there's this difficulty on capturing long-term dependencies, even when you have gated uh, units like LSTM or GRU, because they have these gates, right? But these gates are soft. So they are only 0 or 1 asymptotically. So when you apply that gate many, many times, uh, that's not close to 1 or close to 0 anymore. So you have this memory leak, uh, even for these gated units. And also, uh, during training, you could have these vanishing or exploding gradients uh, issues when, well, you're applying the chain rule many, many times. So in general, we can see that these issues have to do with the length of the graph, and th this is sequential. So let's assume that we cannot change the sequential thing, right? These are RNNs, so these are going to be sequential anyway. Uh, but let's try to address the length of the graph, okay? So what we propose to do is learning how to make this shorter, how to shorten these sequential graphs in order to alleviate the issues I, I mentioned. So what we do is we propose a new model. This is a variation on, on any RNN, actually. So you take whatever RNN you like, your vanilla RNN, LSTM, whatever, and you can apply this modification that we propose so that it's able to skip some, some updates, some input samples. So the, the intuition behind the model is that we want to uh, introduce this kind of binary switch, these two possible behaviors at every time step. So uh, one option would be uh, if we can update this state, so that's the regular RNN operation. The other one is that we simply skip that step. Okay? So how we do this, we propose to do this with a new gate, which is going to be binary, either 1 or 0. So when this gate is 1, we update the state. When this gate is 0, we skip that operation. And you can see this here. right? So when this binary uh, gate is 1, we're going to apply this transition model of the RNN. So this S here is any RNN transition model that's parametric, right? Your vanilla RNN, your LSTM, whatever. And on the other hand, if this is 0, we simply copy the previous uh, hidden state. And you see that there is no dependency here with respect to x of t. So we, cannot, we don't need to use the input here. Of course, this is a bit more complex. Uh, we need to do this. Uh, that's differentiable, that can be trained with SGD and so on. So the actual model is this. Uh, don't get scared by the questions, I'm going to go through them now. Um, so as I was saying, we have this binary gate here, this u of t. This is what I was saying, that is going to uh, trigger one of the two possible operation modes. And as you can see in the second equation, this is simply doing this if-else uh, statement 
with this uh, binary value, right? So if, if this is one, we're gonna keep this first part, this first term of the addition. If it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, on, if it's zero, we're gonna keep the second term, right? So this uh, implementing what I said in the previous slide, either update or copy the hidden state. And then how do we get this value? Um, let's assume that we have a binarizing function. I'm gonna talk about this later, okay? That's gonna take some value that's, that goes between zero and one. That's not binary. You could understand this as some sort of probability of updating. And out of this value, you get the binary one, okay? Zero, one, and then update or do not update this state. And how does this one work? So what we do is implement this intuition that the more time steps were, uh, that you skip the update, the more likely it is that you need to update now, okay? So this is cumulative. What we do is we keep accumulating some value in this variable. So at every time step, we compute the increment for this. So we make it more likely to update it the next time step or simply reset this counter to zero when, whenever we update. So we apply this, so we keep incrementing this value. You see that the equation is a bit long here just because we need to make sure that we don't go beyond one, but it's simply accumulating this, this value. And that's the whole model. But then I think it's simpler to see it if we split this. So instead of having the whole model, we split it into two possible modes, okay? So when we update, that's the, that's the uh, graphics on the, on the left, uh, you can see it's, simp it's as simple as taking uh, your RNN and updating the state, as you would do with your regular RNN, plus computing this increment here. It's just a linear layer with a sigmoid, that's it. A new scalar value, and that's all, all the things that you need to do here. And when you copy this state, uh, you can see that the state goes directly from the input to the output of the cell, so nothing is done to it. But you may say, yeah, but you still need to compute this increment, so you need to do some computation here. That's right, that's the theory, that those are the equations, but in practice, we already have that value. Because since it's computed in the same hidden state that we already had, we already know that value, so we can convert this to just, you know, cache that value, and you don't need to compute it anymore. But again, you could say, yeah, but you need to do this addition. So still need to compute something. Yeah, but again, in practice, what we can do is we can uh, compute uh, beforehand in advance the number of steps to skip. So we don't need to do this addition n times. We know that we just can compute this n, go directly to the next update, and if we need this value, simply do n times the increment and add it once. So in practice, this allows for smarter or more efficient implementations where you could skip all the computations in, in these steps where you don't really need to update this state. So now uh, remember that we had this binarizing function. I didn't talk it, uh, about it yet. So we could do many things here. So we have this probability of updating. One option would be to sample from a Bernoulli distribution with that probability. But we, here we take a simpler uh, version of this, which is doing deterministic, uh, this deterministic rounding. So we have this uh, step function. Whenever this uh, probabil probability of updating is below dot five, we squash it to zero. Otherwise, if it's over dot five, we simply uh, set it to one. But if you work with backprop, uh, probably you know that this is not differential. Well, this is differentiable, but this won't backpropagate the gradients because the gradient is null everywhere. So what we do is we use this trick through estimator. Uh, this is a bias estimator that's been used in different works, and it turns out that it works uh, quite well. So what you do is, in the forward pass, you do this step function. In the backwards pass, uh, you assume that you simply had the identity there. So this is biased, but it propagates the gradient, and in practice, this works. And, but the same kind of estimator could be used if we were doing the stochastic version. So well, with this, we could already train the model, and I could show you the results, but I want to introduce another concept before that, which is that uh, the fact that we can add an external loss function here to encourage the network to use freeware state updates. So depending on your application, on the hardware where you need to do the inference, maybe you need to find a different um, uh, operation point uh, between in this trade-off between the performance on the task and how many updates, how many floating point operations you need to achieve it. So here what we do is the most uh, simple, simple case, which is since we know which uh, state updates uh, were done uh, and when, we simply add a penalization which is constant so that the network encourages to, you know, to minimize this loss as well. So that 
it finds solutions in the space where you can solve the task while doing uh, as few uh, updates as possible. But if, for instance, you have a different task where, I don't know, uh, for, for a reason you need to have very early predictions, you could also tailor a different loss function here where this coefficient, this cost per sample, is not independent of t. For instance, it grows with time so that the network will use more the first samples, but it will use fewer of the last samples of your sequences, or whatever application you have here, you could tune this, okay? So this is quite flexible. Okay, so with this, we can already go to the experiments. This is the model that we trained. And I'm gonna show two experiments, although we have uh, a few more of them in the paper. So first of them is MNIST. So MNIST, uh, usually we address with, uh, this with CNNs. We have these digits, black and white images, and you need to classify between zero and nine, what's the digit in the image. Uh, but that's something quite common in RNN papers is to take MNIST, flatten the images, so you have quite long vectors, almost 800 uh, pixels, feed them one by one to the RNN, and once you've seen the whole image, you classify. You have a fully connected layer there and a softmax, and you classify the digit. And this is quite challenging, actually, because it has almost 800 uh, inputs, so it's quite long. And what I'm gonna show now is a table you'll see with three different models, okay? So we're gonna try LSTM and GRU in all the experiments, and for each one of them, we have three rows in the table, okay? One of them is the regular, say, LSTM. The other one is the skip LSTM version. And then we have a third uh, model, that's another baseline, with, where uh, what we do is after training the, say, the skip LSTM, we see, okay, it's using half of the sequence. Okay, then we train an LSTM, where it randomly chooses half of the pixels and train on that. Okay, so that's another baseline to actually assess whether the gain that we get is related to the fact that we have shorter sequences or the fact that we are learning which inputs to use, okay? So these are the results. So as you were saying, we have LSTM and GRU and three different versions of every one of them. So what we can see in general is that the skip RNN models for both LSTM and GRU can solve the task using half of the pixels only, and they achieve same or even better results than the baseline models. And this is actually not related to the fact that all we have shorter sequences, because as you can see here, for instance, for the LSTM where we skip half of the inputs, okay, so it's like closer comparison uh, to skip LSTM, the, there's a performance drop, okay? So it's not as easy as simply doing some random downsampling because you really need to somehow internalize in the net what these skips, these jumps that it's doing, so what's the probably the, uh, like the distance between the inputs and so on, right? So it's, uh, so it's something in favor of our model. And also for the LSTM especially, the, the improvement in performance is quite important here. So we go from 91% accuracy to 97%. And what is so is that usually this is probably related to an optimization issue with LSTM. With these very long sequences, it's harder to, optim to optimize the LSTM. And on the other hand, for skip LSTM, the, the curves, the, the training loss was quite uh, smoother, okay, in comparison to LSTM. Also the variance between runs, it was uh, smaller so it seems that that optimization here is easier thanks to these shorter paths uh, f uh, through which the gradients need to be backpropagated. And what's nice about uh, these MNIST experiments is that we can just uh, build these images back, okay, go back to these 2D images, and we can visualize what's going on here, which pixels are being used and which ones are skipped. So the pixels that are being used are the red ones, the blue ones are being skipped, and you can see, first of all, that this is input dependent, okay? So this is not some sort of mask that somehow is learned for all the images and that's shared, but it depends on the image. Of course, it usually seems to focus on the center of the, of the image, but you can see that the pattern is different depending on what it finds and the kind of uh, digit that we have there. Al although some parts like skipping the top and the bottom paddings seems to be constant across all the images in the data set because, well, that's background, that's everywhere in the data set, so this is not discriminative, you don't need it to classify the digits. So this is input dependent, this is something that we wanted and it seems to be shown here. And also, we can see that this is changing during training, okay? So what we have here in every one of these animated images are a few examples in the validation set uh, at different epochs during training. 
And you, what you can see here is that this mask is, uh, is moving, so it's being trained. It's not something that's somehow imposed at the beginning of training and then it learns to deal with it. No, it's actually tuning it to find the best spot, the best pixels to, to focus on uh, during training. So this shows that actually the model is kind of training the whole addition, these uh, skipping capabilities that we gave it. OK, so now let's move on to the second set of experiments that I wanted to show today. And this is action localization on video. This is in Charade's data set. OK, so now what we have is an input sequence. This is an, a sequence of frames. But also we have an output sequence. OK, so this is a many-to-many -many task. The output now is not a single classification label, but we need to do classification at every time step. OK, so the setting is a bit different here. We're using two stacked RNN layers. Uh, using the hidden state in the top one to determine whether to update or to skip the update. And what we do is we take uh, the RGB frames, feed them through a CNN, this is a VGG16 network, and give them to the RNN, okay? So no flow information here. So here you have the results. So now I don't, I'm not showing the table because it's a bit hard to find the patterns in these tables with many rows. So I prepared this figure where you can see the mean average precision, that's the performance on the task, because you have, uh, it's multi-class, so you can have different classes at the same time step. And so mean average precision is the, like, the official metric for this data set. Uh, as a function of the floating point operations that you need uh, to get or to achieve that, that performance. And so you have LSTM on the left and GRU on the right. And the blue points are the baselines. The, the uh, orange ones, in case you cannot read the legend, are the, are the skip RNN models. Okay, so first thing that we see here, this map perhaps can be surprising when compared to the previous experiment, is that the fewer flops that we use here, um, the fewer uh, MAP points we get. Okay, so the actually there's a drop in performance when we reduce the computation. And this can be explained by the fact that this is not a many-to-one task anymore. Uh, so it's a many-to-many, -many, and you need fine uh, like localization of the tasks. So whenever you skip uh, some of the frames, maybe you're skipping the boundary at some point. So of course, our, uh, your outputs are not as fine-grained anymore. And what we see is that, of course, yes, we have this drop in performance, uh, but the skip RNN models are always uh, as good or better than the random baselines. So it seems that learning when to skip is better than simply skipping randomly. That's somewhat expected. But also I think that what's important to see is that the difference when we have fewer flops. So please uh, note that, notice that this axis is logarithmic, OK? So when we are um, comparing the leftmost points with the right ones, there's like a tenfold difference in, in flops, OK? The ones in the left are using 10% of the frames only, more or less. So we see that fewer frames the larger this gap between the baselines and our models uh, becomes. And this is nice, because uh, we see that when we have fewer flops, it's more important to select the key frames to use, because, of course, the random baselines can still uh, be helped by the fact that uh, there's this strong correlation between frames and redundancy. So sometimes, if you miss some frame, that's not a problem, because the next frame is going to have more or less the same information. But when you can use only a few of them, it's very important to select which one to use. So, well, these were the two tasks uh, that I wanted to show today. But if you're curious and you want to uh, learn more about this, we have many more experiments in the, in the paper. This is like the whole list of them. And I think what's interesting on this is that we have different kinds of data. So we use synthetic data, images, video, text, but also different kind of tasks. So we had classification. We had the regression. We had many-to-one tasks and many-to-many -many tasks. Uh, so I think this shows that this model is robust. It's not very application or specific, OK? This can work well in different kind of domains. Um, well, just to sum up, uh, we presented this new RNN architecture that's, in general, what we saw in the experiment, that's able to preserve the same performance on the task while reducing the amount of computation that you need to solve it. Uh, and we saw this on top of, well, the most used RNN architectures nowadays, uh, being LSTM and GRU. Also, that this worked well for many different kinds of tasks, modalities, and sources of information and data. 
And also, I did not mention this yet, it's that this is orthogonal to other advances in RNNs. So say that, I don't know, layer norm is very, very important for your task. It improves uh, your performance. You can still use layer norm here. And this could apply to many of the recent uh, techniques that are boosting the performance on RNNs uh, recently. So before finishing the presentation, of course, I would like to uh, thank uh, everybody that made uh, this work possible. And mention also that we have a project site where you have the code uh, in TensorFlow. It's open source. You can go download it and use it if you like it. Uh, so that's everything. Thank you very much. <laughs>
trying to say is that this is the function, but w um, where do the inputs that will go into this function come from? Yeah, so the input to this function is this here. So it's kind of this accumulated value. Okay, so you kind of have it uh, starts at zero, and at every time step you increase it, and you pass it <coughs> through the binarizing function, and this gives you either one or a zero, then go to the next time step, increase again uh, the input to this function, go through this thresholding again until it's one, <coughs> and then you update. If it's zero, you keep adding and accumulating the value and increasing it. This updating is not looking at the data at all. Yeah, you don't want to look at the data, but it feels somehow unsatisfactory. No? That, let's say if I have a video, now I have to say, okay, I'm not updating for 10 frames, and maybe two frames from now I have to, a shot change. The camera goes to exactly. the camera. No, it's like that, and it, it doesn't know. I mean, is there any way it could look at the data? Or uh, everything goes so, down? yeah, you could modify this so that it looks at the data. That's another option. But the problem there is then, then you need to process the whole input sequence. So you still uh, have some gain in the sense that perhaps the gradients backpropagate through fewer steps and so on. But say that you have a video, okay? The main bottling, the video. So in this, when you compute the number of floating point operations and also the time that you spent for every frame, you spent like 99% of the time in the CNN. Mm -hmm. So you would still need to go through the CNN uh, every single time to predict whether you use that frame or you don't use it. Um, I mean, you could do that, but then you don't get this gain in, in, the, in terms of uh, floating point operations and speed. So yeah, it's of course you have this trade of the network at some, somehow is kind of predicting ahead of time how many steps to skip. Of course, if the prediction is not very accurate and you have a change of shot or whatever, yeah, you're gonna miss some, some information. Uh, to be honest, trial and error, so we did some sweep uh, across the different uh, values, like a logarithmic one, like powers of 10, and we kept the ones, like you get different points. Uh, sometimes if it's not high enough, uh, it will use all the samples. Uh, if it's too large, it can collapse to not using any. So yeah, this is a very important value to tune, but so far it's trial and error. Um, Yeah, so in, in the Amnis case, yes. But then to generate this plot, for instance, I think this ranges from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 2 uh, in the plot. So like 10 to the minus 4 would be the right side, 10 to the minus 2 would be the leftmost point. Yeah, but it's very important because you have to think that you have kind of direct gradients affecting that layer, and it's very, very important in th that layer in the behavior of the net. Mm, yeah, like this is exact. Column-wise, column I'm seeing that the pattern is similar because the thing is that I think it makes sense that the top and the bottom are skipped because in most mm -hmm. the digits is not there, and the, it doesn't skip the left and right orders because there are some numbers that are closer to there, so it's deciding like yeah, it looks like a two maybe or whatever, but I still know we'll no, it's look true. at that part in case it appears. I think it would be a nice experiment. We did not try. Yeah, we did this zigzag scanning where you start from the top. But yeah, maybe it would be a nice experiment to see what's, what's going on there. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that you could get more accurate models if you check all the inputs and decide whether or not to update based on the previous state, but also on the current input. But then, I mean, for MNIST, I think this is a nice toy experiment to actually debug the model, check that it's working. But like more real world applications like video, it's unfeasible to check all the frames at a you know, 25 or 30 frames per second rate. 
So the main idea is to, instead of doing the down sample like by hand, saying, OK, I'm going to keep one frame out of every 25 of them, because otherwise they cannot process them. It's more like, OK, let's learn what's the optimal way to do so. I don't really know what would happen with that noise, but yeah, probably if it, what I've seen is that if you have some data that's not useful for the prediction, it usually skips it. Okay, so we did an another test uh, with a synthetic data set that's like addition task that's quite common for uh, RNNs, like it was in the original LSTM paper, where you have a sequence of numbers and, and then a sequence of kind of binary flux, okay? telling you whether you need to add that number or not. Okay, so out of your whole sequence, you will have only two values that are marked, and the rest of them are kind of dummy, okay? So if you place that like in a smart way, knowing that some part of the data is always dummy because you will never have uh, a, any marker there, it learns to skip that part all the time. So I guess that yes, if you have some like noisy values that don't or tell you anything about your data that are not discriminative, it can learn to skip them. Okay, I think we should go on to the next uh, speaker. Thank, Thank you. you.